Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. The nonfiction The View from Brimley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South by Eugene Struggs, takes the reader on a trip through the 1940s and 50s in the rural South. The story unfolds in the lower reaches of the Appalachian mountain chain on a plateau called Brindley Mountain. A part of the Sand Mountain Ridge, the area covers Lower Morgan County and Northeast Coleman County. On a hard scrabble farm south of the bustling county seat, a young boy grew to manhood, dreaming of the future journeys and conquest. On the back porch of a little clapboard house, this would-be traveler contemplated the wide, wide horizon stretching out in all directions, full of seemingly endless possibilities and challenges. Little did Eugene know that he would become an international scholar who traveled extensively to Europe, Africa, Asia, Central America, and South America as director of student exchanges and study abroad for the University of South Florida. Dr. C. Eugene Scruggs retired following a long career as a professor and administrator in higher education. His career covered 40 years at four U.S. universities and two European. Following his retirement, he published three books, co-edited one other. His lifelong hobby has been art, currently lives in a retirement community in Lakeland, Florida, where he is actively involved in educational and enrichment programs for senior citizens. Eugene Shruggs, author of The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South, is our guest on This Week in America. Eugene, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Glad to be with you. What a career that you've had, and it all started on that little farm when you're looking out at the expanse of the world and thinking, wow, there's a lot out there. I wish I could be part of it, and and you became one. It's interesting. I describe this as a a hard scrabble farm. Exactly what was that like? Describe where you grew up. A hard scrabble. Uh, it's, a, it's a farm where you barely make a living. Uh, subsistence, I suppose. There were a lot of those back in the 40s and 50s. Most of them went out of business. Uh, it meant that you borrowed money in the spring and planted your seeds and, and hoped that the, in the fall you would have enough cotton and corn to pay off your debts. You know, it's That's basically a hard scramble farm. Well, yeah, a lot of hope goes into that, and it's fascinating, the recollection that you have of those days. They really made an impression on you, didn't they, and shaped who you've been throughout your entire career, your entire life. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, a little hard work, I suppose, will propel you forward. That Yes, exactly, and give you motivation to maybe go beyond the mountain and find out what's what's out there in the, in the rest of the world. We The little town of Coleman, and I want to talk about that. There are a number of German descendants there, and it's interesting during this period how people moved around the country and settled in particular areas. Why were there so many German descendants in your town of Coleman? Yes, that's a good question. It uh, goes back to 1870 when Bismarck and the German Prussians were unifying, that is, forcing the principalities into one country. The Bavarians, in particular, didn't really want to be a part of it. They wanted to stay, you know, their own country or their own principality. They fought. One of them was a name, uh, Johann Gutfried Kohlmann. He came to America uh, because he was kicked out of the country. He came and he was seeking a place where he and his fellow Russians, uh, I'm sorry, Bavarians, could come and settle and eventually found this uh, uh, LNN railroad that goes from Louisville to Nashville. And they were opening up a road down to Birmingham. If anybody listening knows Birmingham, you go right through Coleman to get there and there was no there was no one there except a few Indians. So he, he put out a notice to his friends and in the newspapers in Germany and Europe and America, come over, we've got a nice place where you can live free. And so he did. He got thousands of Germans to come. And so when I was a child, um, which would mean uh, 30, say, some of those people were still alive. They were old, but then the second and third generations. 
So when I went to a store, I went to Klein Dean's, Kreit Line, Stiefermeyer's, Klein's. Uh, the, that, there were no what you might call uh, normal oh, normal yes. names. They were all, <laughs> were all German. You learned so, something about German, and you learned something about spelling at that early age then, too, didn't you? That, uh, right, yeah, yeah, I mean, how do you spell Stiefelmeyer, for example? I can't even say it, so I'm not even going to try to spell it. There was no, like, Smith Brothers store where you could actually do that. So, I mean, yeah. it's such a it's, slice it's of history. No no Jones or Smith oh, yeah, or Brown. Yeah, yeah. Klein Deeds. Try Klein Deeds on. The, yeah, the book is The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South by Eugene Scruggs, our guest on the program. Book available at stratton-press.com in the bookstore, available at other places. We'll give you that uh, throughout the, the course of the program. I was saying it's like a slice of history. When we go back and, and we look at this period, the 40s and the 50s, when the, the United States became, to a great extent, who we are today. And it's such a uh, such an interesting look at that era one we might not get in the history books because it's not a major part of the country where exactly is Brindley Mountain I tried to sort of explain it set the stage in the beginning where exactly is Brindley Mountain well it's at the tail end of the whole Appalachian chain if you it, it runs through you, you don't expect it to be there you think oh well that's up in North Carolina and Virginia yes and uh, upper Georgia, but it comes right through Chattanooga, keeps coming down into Alabama, uh, but it kind of fades away before it gets to Mississippi. But it's just hills at that point, not really mountains. But I called it Brindley Mountain uh, because they call it that, but it's probably, I mean, it, it would be a hill to real folks up in Virginia. They'd say, oh, that's that's not a mountain, that's a hill. <laughs> yeah, it's but, all the relative. view from Brindley Hill doesn't sound very good. <laughs> no, Mountain Lots gives us a little... Lots of Brindley Mountain have read the book. Uh, I didn't think about how many people were descendants of the man who named that. But there are Brindleys who keep contacting me and uh, saying, Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you wrote about Brindley Mountain. Ah, yes. I didn't think anybody knew about it. Well, it, as again, it's a great slice of history, and it's a great story of what Gene went through as he was going up. Eugene Scruggs, if you're Googling that, that's S-C-R-U-G-G-S, the book, The View, from Brindley Mountain, not Hill, Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural south. Talk about working on the farm. And I had friends a couple decades later in the town where I grew up, a small town, to, who lived on the farm. That seemed like just about the hardest work in the world. If the sun was out or even sort of coming out you had a job to do were there jobs on the farm you hated to do uh there were certainly <laughs> there, was, uh, there were probably more hated than i love but uh, i would say picking cotton would have to be at the mm. top of the hate the hate list uh because those burrs have uh, little things like thorns on the end of them if you're not picked cotton you probably think oh that's fun that nice soft cotton but the burr itself, there's five points to it. It's like a star. And, they, and, and as the weather gets cooler, those things get to be like a thorn. You, you can get really messed up in your hands and arms. A lot of people pick it with gloves. Yes. Sure. Yeah, so that, that's one of the hated ones. Uh, feeding the animals was kind of fun. Feeding the chickens, feeding the pigs, whatever. But no, no, no. And the other thing that was hateful was uh, bending over and picking strawberries. I admire those folks here in Florida who come to this neck of the woods to pick strawberries. That is backbreaking. You know, that looks like it is. There's no really easy way to do that, is there? No, you, I mean, you crawl on the ground maybe, but that's... Well, yes. You basically got to just bend over all the way to the ground. This is said in the 1940s, 50s, as you're growing up. What did you do to, for recreation? What what did you do to play games, preteen? You didn't go inside and, uh, uh, you know, get on uh, YouTube and watch videos. What what did you do other than, then we'll talk about the imagination here in a second, but what did you do yeah. to, to play during yeah. that era? Well, we, we certainly didn't. We didn't have TV uh, on a hard scrabble farm. You wouldn't have it anyway, but not, not even in the city. Folks didn't have it till the late 50s as a general rule. 
And I went off to college before I watched any any TV. And my parents got one after I left because they could afford it then, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, we, we played mar We shot marbles. Uh, anytime you found a light, night flat surface that was, you know, dirt, not grass, shoot marbles. We got to be really good and mean at doing that. Um, I love to fly kites. I would make my own kites. Uh, the kites you bought at the 10 cent, by the way, that's another thing. The 10 cent store. Oh, yes. Yes. You, got, <laughs> you go buy a kite for a quarter and you put it up one time and it crashes and it's torn into shreds. So you get some real strong brown paper and some sticks that, that fit underneath a shade. You know, they had shades you would pull down uh, and they would wear out. And so there were sticks in it that were fairly strong. And you could make the, you know, the cross for your, for your, uh, uh, your kite. Yes. And then you could get some really heavy string and you could send that to the next neighborhood. You could send it way out. It's amazing the innovation, the imagination that went into the joy as a child. And as I'm watching, by the way, the video portion of this is up on YouTube and it's on our YouTube channel. Go to thisweekinamerica.us and, and click on videos or just Google uh, the program and YouTube and you'll see Eugene there as well. Sort of the smile on your face. These would sound like I can't imagine growing up uh, where you have to work all the time. You're picking cotton. You've got the strawberries. You're working. You don't have uh, uh, video games to play. You enjoyed that childhood. I, I, I take it. I mean, just in, in looking at the the smile on your face as you're talking about those days. Well, it, you know, it's fun to look back on. It's well, much yeah, more it's more fun now. Yeah, having been there, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more fun to look back. But, but we, we, we I, you know, I lived vicariously. I'd be out in the cotton field and forget about those thorny things and think about what I'd been reading. Uh, I think about uh, these uh, guys out on the ocean, uh, the sailors, or I would think about Africa and say, I'm going to be Tarzan today while I'm picking cotton. And I could imagine, you know, a dialogue between him and his apes and what have you. Living vicariously it kept you sane. Well, yes. So books were a great escape, I take it, then for you. That was sort of... Uh... Uh, where, where you could actually, as you mentioned, live vicariously by, by reading books. I read an awful lot uh, because, of course, no, no TV. So what, what did you do after dark? You read. I did. I love to read and still do it constantly. What kind of response are you getting to the book? The title is The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South by Eugene Scruggs, our guest on the program. What uh, what's it been like writing this book? You mentioned that some people that that live there were like, "Wow, I'm glad you remember these stories because it's a very uh, important part of our youth." What kind of response are you getting? Well, I've gotten responses not only from folks in the South, but believe it or not, some folks in the North who say, "Well, I, I didn't live in the South, but we did the same things. You know, we jumped rope, we flew yes. kites, we shot marbles, we." You know, one of the things they didn't do, though, is to tie a string on a June bug. Everybody seems to think that's a fantastic story. <laughs> Tell me about that. A June bug is probably about as big around as a nickel. Pretty good sized bug. Pretty, pretty hardy. And, and they uh, love in the springtime to eat the early apples. And, and they get all, they get drunk. They eat so much. So you can catch them easily. If you tie a light, real light string, your mother give you some sewing string, tie it on the string of one of those. When it wakes up and not drunk anymore, it'll fly around and you can just run up and down the place with your June bug up in the air by you. <laughs> just... Well, you know, that, <laughs> you know, you got to be crazy to do stuff like that, but, you know, you got to have fun. But yes, it brought fun to you, and it's amazing what you can do when you don't have the what we would go to a toy chest today or go into a child's room and you got all these great toys there. If you had a stick and uh, and some string, you could actually have some fun for a couple of hours outdoors and enjoying yourself. Eugene Scruggs, our guest on the program, the view from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South. The book's available at stratton-press.com and their bookstore, available where, wherever books are sold. 
Time going so quickly. A few minutes left in the program. Let's talk about that that back porch. And that's sort of like the launching pad, it sounds like for you, where you would sit and imagine. As you sat there thinking about this great world that was out there, did you ever think that you would become an international traveler, an international scholar? Was that even on the radar at that time? <laughs> well, I, I when I look back, I, I, I had great thoughts, but I didn't see myself probably doing near as much traveling as I actually did. Um, as, as I was in my late teens, my, my thing I really wanted to do, my, I didn't have a bucket list because I was too young to have a bucket list. But the first thing I wanted to do was go to Kenya. I wanted to go to Kenya and go on a safari. But I never got to Kenya. The one place I didn't go. I've been to <laughs> Africa. But <laughs> so... Uh, but but no, so I didn't I didn't see what was going to happen. I didn't see that that I would end up uh, being responsible for making sure that students in any discipline could go to any university practically around the world, and that I could go and and arrange uh, exchanges in China, Venezuela, Mexico, uh, Canada, France, of course, Germany, England. This was this well. It's true. I just didn't. I didn't imagine it quite that that far along. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned education at that level in your life. You're there in the Brindley Mountain. Talk about the motivation you had to to go to school to learn uh, this fabulous education. Being there, helping other people now, what was the motivation for that? I mean, I'm sure there wasn't like a community college right down the street from where you lived. It really took some some effort on your part to, to get that education. Talk about what drove you to, to get there. Well, first of all, in the little high school I went to, there was no, there was no counselor. You couldn't go to a counselor and they'd give you a test to see what your aptitude was. Yes. Um, I thought my aptitude was probably art. So because at age five, I started drawing and I realized that unlike other people, I could actually draw something and it looked like it. And so I ended up in grade school being the grades, the, the, the homeroom artist. So I, I missed a lot of, of dr drudgery in the classroom by being standing up and drawing on the freezes before Christmas and Easter and Fourth of July. Well, not Fourth of July, because but doing that artwork. So this is what I figured. Well, I'll end up being a professional artist. But the more I thought about that, I thought, why well, I, I like to eat, and a <laughs> professional artist doesn't get to eat until he's dead. <laughs> well, that yes, is it does he's got errors. They can eat, but uh, yes. So I said, "Well, I better go to college." <laughs> and, uh, so I was going to—I went to college, and I was going to major in physics. And a really, really weird—it probably take too long to tell, but I—I uh, I went the first day. I was enrolling, and I wanted to take Spanish. I'd had two years in high school, and I went, and they had no openings in Spanish. And the professor says, but, but I've got a, a beginning French. Would you like to take the French class? I said, no, I'm, I don't, I'm not interested in taking French. So I went around and around the room trying to register. I had the last name, the freshman, the last day. Nothing was available to fit my schedule. So finally I go back and I tell the fella who's behind the desk and rolling. I said, okay, I'll take your French course. And of course, I ended up being a French professor. <laughs> or, or let's put it this way: a professor of French, even though I was sort of adopted by the French. Yes. Uh, by, by being awarded uh, one of their high awards for disseminating French culture throughout the years. It's just amazing the background and where it all started. And that's the topic of Eugene's book, The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural South by Eugene Scruggs, our guest on the program. That's S-C-R-U-G-G-S. -G -G You'll find the book available at stratton-press.com in, in the book section there. Uh, Eugene, a couple of minutes left in the program. 
uh, art's still important to you. You're involved now in vocal music. You are always learning and expanding. Talk about what you're doing now because you're just not sitting back watching television all day. You're out there enjoying life to the, to the max. Well, I'm in a retirement community, uh, which gives me a kind of, um, of uh, what would you call it, a captive audience. <laughs> so that I can profess. So years ago, I began something called the Academy. So twice a month, we had programs where some of us would give discussions, talks, presentations, colleges nearby, we would latch on to someone to come and talk. So that was one of the, th and I did quite a few of those programs. Uh, but I also uh, have offered art courses occasionally to those who wanted to. Uh, for, for the last year or two, we've had a great books reading group. Uh, by great books, we mean those who might have made it to the top 100 in just about anybody's survey. So we've had a lot of fun with that. And I also talked to those in assisted living twice a month in something we call the dialogue, Tuesday morning dialogue. So the effort there is just to get them talking. So we usually talk about old things, reminiscing, you know, because they can all do what I can do. Yes. If they can go back, <laughs> they can go back further. Because believe it or not, we've got several 100-year-old people wow. here. Impressive. So you're still yeah. you're still learning and teaching. Are you working on any any new books now? I mentioned that you've uh, written three others, co-edited another one, and of course this book. Are you working on another book? Yeah. Yes, I am. I'm. Um, I've done a first draft of um, something I call the widening view, and as you might suspect, that's the sequel to the view from Brindley Mountain. Yes. yes. It. It's what is it's the view as it widened. Uh, so um, I won't go into it because maybe someday we'll talk about it. I hope we, I'm just thinking I really would like to read that and to talk about that. That's sort of uh, the sequel to to the book we're talking about on the program. The book is okay. The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural south by Eugene Scruggs, our guest on the program. That's S-C-R-U-G-G-S. Book available the usual places. I'll send you to stratton-press.com and all of this available on our website. Uh, Eugene, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Great stories. Loved having you with us on the program to share these. Hopefully we can do it again. Thank you for being with us. Sure. It's been a great pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. It's been my pleasure. Eugene Scruggs, author of The View from Brindley Mountain, a memoir of the rural south. Book available at stratton-press.com. Information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Back on today's program after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.